Welcome everybody to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and this week we're doing a deep dive on synergy. What does that entail? Well, uh, that entails a lot of things. I'm recording this episode a little bit later in the week than I usually do. Because I was, as I was writing the, the notes for this episode, I just kept going, ooh, I can talk about this, I can talk about that, I can talk about this, and the, the rabbit hole just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, synergy is a very broad and deep topic. Uh, my ultimate goal for this episode is, you know, it's a few few things there. Number one, I kind of want to de-buzzwordify uh, the word synergy. I think it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. You know, people say, oh, this is a synergistic format, or you have to draft your deck thinking about synergy. And it's like, okay, well, what does that really mean? Like, if I say to you, draft your deck more synergistically, uh, does that really help the average drafter? I don't know. I, I kind of want to define synergy, you know, a little bit better, just so people, you know, when we're talking about synergy, it's not so much this just like magic buzzword. It actually puts some, some, some words to it, right? Um, and then two, of course, I want to just give you the tools to inject you with some ideas so that when you... Or drafting, you know, you sit down in your next draft, you can take the kind of theoretical stuff we're talking about today and put it into practice and actually come out the other end with a better deck. So that's what we're here to do today. Before we start, of course, I got to start uh, by shouting out the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. That is the place you can go, the number one place if you want to support the podcast or you want to support any of my content. There's a bunch of reward tiers over there that we will give back to you if you choose to give to us. Helps keep the lights on. If you feel like you've given, uh, if you've gotten another, you know, a few wins out of your drafts, or maybe won a few more packs from your local game store, or something like that, check it out. There's also, of course, the limited level ups Discord. You can go command Discord. We're recording here live on Twitch. If you're in the Twitch chat, or if you just want to search the limited level ups Discord, you can go to bit.ly/join the Discord. That's Discord with a ch, like quarter calls, and that's it. All right, let's jump into our show. So. Uh, first off, we're going to start with some big picture thoughts on synergy. So as I tend to do with the show, I want to start big picture as broad as possible. Talk about some big picture thoughts on synergy, give us some context, and then eventually zoom in with some specifics and, uh, you know, some application for when you sit down at the draft. So, uh, let's start with defining synergy or, or at least my definition of synergy. Um, so that you can, you know, effectively put it into practice a little bit better in the broadest of terms. I like to think of synergy as just Cards that play well together, right? Cards that when you put this combination of 40 cards into your deck, they help you to achieve your ultimate goal of winning a game better than some other combination of 40 cards. Because that's the end goal of Synergy, or just deck building in general. You're just trying to build the, the deck with the cards that play together the best so that you can win more. Um, yeah, d don't lose sight of that last part. That's important. So that you can win more is your ultimate goal. That's a very broad definition of synergy like by that definition lands and spells <laughs> is technically a synergy which you know it is a synergy right like mountain plus lightning bolt is a better synergy than island plus lightning bolt to put it in very very abstract terms but you know again that's not that helpful narrowing in a little bit there's this idea that synergy can be described as two cards or a group of cards that when you combine them together they're greater than the sum of their parts right cards that play better together than they would just alone. Sort of like a, a 1 plus 1 equals 3 situation. And I think that's true. If you even look, I think that's the dictionary definition of synergy. Like, better than the sum of their parts. While I think that is a very accurate and, and valid description of synergy, um, I think that thinking about it as, like, the 1 plus 1 equals 3 type deal, you know, that fits into the cards that play well together. But I think if you're thinking about that too uh, narrowly or too strictly, it is this very common trap that players fall into thinking about the end goal of drafting with synergy in mind is to purely do so for the sake of synergy, right? Synergy for the sake of synergy, being able to go, oh, hey, look, my cards all say treasure on them, for example. Cool, I'm, all my cards look like they play well together. Rather than for the sake of the ultimate end goal I was talking about of just building the best deck overall, which of course is um, just a way of saying that it's very easy to convince yourself to play bad cards in the hopes of turning them into good cards. Right? It's very, it's a very enticing and alluring idea of being like, oh, look at these bad cards I can put together, right? Like, and they can be something better than the sum of their parts. That happens sometimes, but you very much don't want to get dragged into that uh, that trap. A common pitfall, right? I've seen this with people all, all the time. Something along the lines of like, well, you know, I've heard about how you need to draft with synergy in mind. So if I take my Glittermonger in my Capenna Express, right? I can get a four mana six six. Isn't that so good? Like putting these cards in my deck seems good. That that's synergy. 
The problem with that, of course, is that while Glittermonger and Competitor Express do play well together, you know, quote unquote, um, if you just look at the text box, it's like, okay, cool. Like I can see where the synergy lies there. After playing with the cards, you realize that one, those cards aren't good enough when you don't draw that combo together to play on their own. They just don't do enough. And two, even when you do draw them together, the output on that synergy isn't power enough to make it for the times that you do draw them separately. The risk isn't worth the reward. It's like one plus one isn't actually equaling three here. It's still equaling two or even you know, arguably less than two. There's nothing that says that you have to play with bad cards to be a synergistic deck, right? And there's certainly exceptions to this. And sometimes the synergies between two bad cards is so good that you will want to do so. But those are exceptions. And we're going to get into that. Um, but I do just want to start this episode by saying that putting generically good cards in your deck will win you a lot of games. And you shouldn't deviate from that as, as your main thing, right? You could even argue that putting a bunch of good cards in your deck, like Inspiring Overseer, Jewel Thief, um, that's like a type of synergy. Because on the most fundamental level, those cards will synergize with the rest of your deck just, you know, by virtue of casting them, right? Cards like Overseer and Jewel Thief do a good thing compare, uh, combined with the rest of the cards in your deck because they just progress you towards winning so easily. Keep in mind that ultimate end goal, right? When you're drafting and building with synergy, ask yourself, does including this combo of cards actually make my deck better or am I being too cute, right? Especially in limited, I need a very good reason to play other car cards that are uh, other cards that are not just the best cards in a vacuum, I would say. Now, again, we're going to get into the reasons why, but that's my baseline. Uh, a very long-winded way of just saying, just play your good cards to start off with. But of course, <laughs> the flip side of this is that Magic and Draft isn't just about taking the best card of the pack in a vacuum every single time. It's a game that does reward understanding when to play with the cards that aren't just, you know, the best cards pick on pack one, but, you know, instead when you have five ninjas in your pile or whatever, it's important to consider and understand those spaces too when you do get to use the uh, cards that are less good in a vacuum in some spots. Just as I warned, that there is a danger of getting too cute and putting bad cards in your deck for the sake of fulfilling some sort of, I don't know, synergy quota. There's also a danger of never deviating from tier lists or using 17 lands, game in hand win rate to like using that as too much of a crutch, right? Not considering all the cards as options. I think a lot of the time when I'm doing draft log reviews or whatever, looking at people's drafts, um, I'll go like, oh, why did you take card A over card B here when card B looks like it would be really good in their deck and they just said oh well like, I looked at 17 lands and 17 lands told me card A was better and again it's I'm kind of it's a little bit mixed messagey here it, it's it's a combination of both where I'm saying play the good cards but also be aware that there are going to be a lot of times when card A is not always going to be the best option even though pick one pack one it might be it's very easy to group cards in a binary or think of cards as a binary and I think people tend to think of cards like that it's either the card is busted it's it's amazing uh or it's a bad card you don't want to put this in your deck right and when you group let's say 50 percent of the cards in a set into the this card is bad i don't want to touch these my eyes just glaze over them in the draft um when you when you group like a bunch of cards into that bucket you do miss out on the times when those cards would actually be good in your deck for example this past Arena Open, NCAA, who is a, uh, a mod of my chat and also a Discord member and also has been on the podcast a bunch and uh, just like absolutely fantastic limited magic. Uh, he had a deck in the Open where he had two Giadas, the, the uh, two mana, two, two rare flying vigilance creature that, uh, you know, pumps your angels and adds mana for angels. He played multiple copies of Paragon of Mordinity in his deck, which is the four mana, two, two. That's, you know, artifact creature. You can pump it. It has flying. It's an angel, of course. That is not a card that you would normally consider putting in your deck. But when you have two Jadas and you can reliably somewhat uh, have that card in your opening hand, Paragon of Mordinity looks pretty good as a three mana, three, three flyer instead, right? And so if you always just group Paragon in that bucket or put it in that bucket, if this card is unplayable, you're going to end up in spots where, hey, you don't notice those synergies when they might come up, right? The key to identifying powerful or useful synergies is just to keep an open mind, right? When I do set reviews with Ethan, uh, I tend not to dismiss the bad cards just, just like on face value, right? I'm the kind of person who goes, well, where could this card be good, right? Looking for the best in the bad cards, if you will, just like kind of, kind of finding the best, <laughs> you know, it's like you find uh, the best out of uh, uh, people, like looking for the best in them. I kind of do that with cards too. Of course, this is much to Ethan's dismay because that takes, that makes the uh, the set reviews go six hours long, but you know, that that's kind of how I like to approach cards. 
And again, uh, it's certainly important to first and foremost, know what the good cards are and not get too hung up on the bad cards that could do something once in a blue moon. But it's also very important to keep an open mind for when those bad cards could be good, right? Um, maybe a way of thinking about this is like, how good is the card on a scale of one to 10? Or sorry, not how good the card is on a scale of one to 10, but something like, uh, what is its frequency of playability, right? How often is this bad card or just a card in general going to make my deck and it'll be good in that deck? Yeah, like, how often would Vampire Scrivenger be good in my deck? Five mana, four and a black, two, two flyers, and whenever you gain life, you put a counter on it. Whenever you lose life, uh, you put a counter on it. And I can imagine spots where it's like, okay, I have a lot of life gain in my deck or a lot of life loss. And, like, you can imagine, oh, cool, this card could be in my deck. But it just turns out that there's not enough good life, land, life gain and life loss cards in the set to make this card work properly in Yukapenna to be, you know, a, a five mana card on turn six or whatever. Or sorry, five, five on turn six. Um, and it's just like the payoff isn't all that good. So I would say like zero out of 10 times that card is going to be good in my deck. Paragon of Modernity, maybe that's one out of 10 times, right? What about a combat trick? Maybe that's five out of 10 times where, um, you know, a card like Inspiring Overseer, 10 out of 10 times that's going to be good, right? So assigning that type of value to a card uh, and knowing the conditions that you'll play a big score or a gold hound or a security bypass, that can be a big part of mastering a draft format. I think... You know, at this point in the podcast, it might be helpful just to like uh, do a, like a little bit of a self-assessment for a second and ask yourself if you're a player that you find yourself, um, you know, maybe you're drawn to getting too cute and playing bad cards for the sake of synergy, or you're the second group of player I've been talking about here, where you're somebody who tends to look at things a little bit too black and white potentially, right? Um, in my content, I always try to speak to all types of players with all different types of priors. Um, so it might be helpful to think about which camp you fall into uh, as we go forward, right? And go, oh, like, yeah, I tend to play bad cards a little too often, I think. Um, or maybe you're like, oh, I don't play the bad cards <laughs> often enough, right? It's good to know kind of like, as I'm talking about these different concepts, understand your priors because maybe some of the stuff I'm saying doesn't necessarily apply to you. And that actually is just a good tip, I think, for any listening to any content too. Just like, you know, small aside here. Um, a lot of times it's like, oh, they're saying like people underrate you know, whatever card it is, but it's like, is that true? Like, I, I really like that card. Well, maybe, you know, the, they're not talking to you. They're talking to the broad audience. And it's good to, as your own player, know where you're falling. And so you can, you know, intake that information appropriately. Anyways, totally off topic. The best decks, of course, are a combo of good cards and synergy, right? The best cards are, or the best decks in Magic are when you're full of cards that you're just happy to play on their own, but those cards also have synergy with each other. I think Blue-White in Yucapenna is the best deck in the format, partially because there's a lot of just good blue and white cards, right? But also because those cards naturally have synergies with each other. Blue and white, I think, is actually a really good example of this, uh, of the type of synergy deck you should strive for in most limited formats, because you don't have to make concessions to enable synergies. You're just playing your good cards and they just work together, right? You can draw your cards in pretty much any order and be happy with them. When you go Rafine's Informant into, into like, uh, Celestial Regulator on three, tapped on your opponent's creature, you're just playing cards you want to play anyways, and you pull so far ahead of your opponent. The flip side of this, of course, is a deck like Green Red Treasure, on the other hand, where it's like, that's the exact opposite, where its cards are generally below rate or don't line up well with the format, and there are the synergies that you could assemble, they don't accomplish anything special. So it's like trying hard to assemble a synergy that might not even be worth it while also putting bad cards in your deck. I will say that there is a, a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing going on here sometimes where if you're trying to identify which cards belong in the this card is just good camp or what card is like a synergy card, the line gets blurry there a bit sometimes, right? So I'll use backup agent for an example, which is, you know, two mana, one, one, when it enters the battlefield to put a, a counter on something. Um, is that card good in Yucapenna because... You know, that's just an inherently good card. Or is it because it plays well with Silver Servant and Celestial Regular and Majestic Metamorphosis? And I could go on and on and on about cards it plays well with. Backup Agent is a card that went under the radar, actually, for a few days when the format first came out. Because this type of card is not the type of card that is generally good in a format. We have seen this card before, and it hasn't been that good. Right? Just like two mana creature that puts a counter on something. Another good example. We saw a Virus Beetle in... Neon Dynasty and Virus Beetle's analog, uh, the Corrupted Court Official, is nowhere near as good as the version, uh, not nowhere near as good as uh, Virus Beetle because there's contextual factors that made Virus Beetle so much better, right? Ninjas and artifacts were a stronger synergy than the sacrifice synergies that exist in Yucapenna. I mention all this just because 
me telling you, you know, just focus on the good cards mostly does get a bit muddy when format context plays such a large role of what makes a good card, right? I guess a good way maybe to think about this is go back to the whole um, situation I was talking about with the idea of frequency of playability. You know, how often is Scrivener good in my deck? How often is Paragon of Virginity good in my deck? When a card like Backup Agent has so many little good synergies in the format, you should just consider it a good card in the format, even though this type of card, Iron Shell Beetle or, you know, whatever you know it is, was not good in the past, right? This You'll run into some, some trouble here, of course, when you go, oh, Backup Agent was really good in New Capanna, just like we went Virus Beetle was really good in Neon Dynasty, and then maybe that doesn't apply um, so well to future formats, but that's just kind of a wrinkle that you have to kind of account for and just know about it, right? Then I'm also going to talk about something that I, I want to call synergy out of necessity. So I think everything I've talked about so far applies to both limited and constructed magic, right? In constructed, there are really, really good cards and there are less good cards. And you need to often justify um, a reason or have a reason to play the less good cards in your deck rather than just shove all the best, you know, the top, there, there's often like tier lists of top 10 cards in standard where it's like Fable of the Mirror Breaker and Rafine are up there, right? You need reasons not to play those cards. And the cool thing, of course, about Magic is this happens quite frequently in Constructed, right? That, that's part of what makes Magic cool, is you can have all these weird combos of, like, not great-looking cards that come together and make something that is greater than some of their parts. There are still mid-range decks in Constructed, right, where you're just playing all the best cards. But there's also combo decks that play, like, you know, zero-mana artifacts that don't really do anything on their own. This weekend, um, I played in the Explorer Qualifier, and I played a deck uh, called Mardu Greasefang, which, for those who aren't familiar, it's this combo deck combo slash kind of like attrition -y deck that um it's looking to play grease fang which is that uh three mana black and white four three that reanimates vehicles from uh, neon dynasty reanimates parhelion which is this gigantic eight mana vehicle and like you know, hopes to just overwhelm your opponent on turn three you wouldn't put any of those cards or either of those cards in just like a generic mardu mid-range deck in your constructed deck but that synergy is definitely worth playing right it's worth playing cards that are um, not great in a vacuum, but you do get uh, better than the sum of their parts kind of stuff going on there. In draft, there is an additional layer that happens, right? Because you don't just have your pick of all the best cards in the format. You end up in spots sometimes where you have to play cards that aren't great in a vacuum. Maybe you're short on playables. Maybe the draft just went in a funny way where, uh, you know, you just didn't, things didn't pan out the way you wanted it to. Um, this is kind of what I would call like making the best of the bad cards because sometimes your deck is set up to play a backstreet bruiser, right? The two mana three three defender. If you have counters on, you know, two counters and creatures you control, that thing can attack, right? Sometimes that card isn't that bad in your deck. Sometimes you want a card like Gilded Pinions, where it's just like, okay, well, I have a few creatures that are pretty good to give flying, and I have a use for the treasure I'm splashing, and it's just like, okay, I can actually justify you playing this card. Maybe you have a bunch of inspiring overseers in your you know, your 22nd card is not very good, but you have a patch up and you're like, well, patch up, which is the thing that reanimates uh, mana value three or less worth of creatures from your graveyard. That card's not very good in general, but if it's getting back an overseer consistently, it's probably better than like generic filler playable, like, you know, ready to rumble, like deal five or Paragon of Mergenity, something like that. These cards are worse in a vacuum probably than those cards, but they do have a spot in your deck, right? So sometimes when you're short on playables, look for those best of the bad cards. I think that uh, that's a really good way to get an edge. Some sets, I should also mention that some sets are much more likely to lend themselves to synergy decks than others. In general, sets that are flatter in power, aka sets that don't have a bunch of commons that stand head and shoulders above the rest of them, they tend to be... Um, more synergy based because the value of a card in your deck is much more dependent on how that card plays with your other cards rather than its standalone power, right? If power level is flat and all the cards are around the same power level, um, then you need to do something to make your cards work in a way that is greater than the sum of their parts to actually get some sort of advantage against your opponents, right? Otherwise, it's just like medium cards, you know, all 7 out of 10s versus 7 out of 10s. You want to turn your 7 out of 10s into 10 out of 10s some, some way. Um, I think that Strixhaven was actually a really good example of that, where, yeah, you had Lesson Learn cards, which were powerful, you'd pick those early, but those required you to draft specific cards, and, you know, it required you to be, like, a good mix of Lesson and Learn cards, and sometimes you had Guiding Voice that asked you to have early creatures, so you could put your Guiding Voice counter on something and learn early to get your uh, your environmental sciences, right? There was a good amount of, like, well, I, want th I have this, so I want that, and that kind of stuff going on, right? But you also had really deep synergies where... 
um, you had the blue decks with Serpentine Curve, right? Which is, for those who don't know, three and a blue for a sorcery, you make a fractal, which is equal to the amount of uh, instant sorceries in your grave in exile. So what these decks would do is they would just dump a bunch of spells into their grave, have very, very uh, low creature counts. You're talking like, you know, three or four creatures in your deck and make gigantic Serpentine Curves. There were blue decks in that format, which would die for four Serpentine Curves. And there was blue decks in that format, which had a bunch of creatures and just didn't want Serpentine Curve. So the value of Serpentine Curve was very much dependent on the deck you were drafting and uh, just like the cards around it. You know, this wasn't just Serpentine Curve. There's a lot of cards in the format that were like that. A set like New Capenna is the opposite of this, right? Where I don't think there are very many cards, and this is kind of a detriment to the format, kind of a complaint that many people have. There's not a lot of cards that change your pick orders because so much of the uh, your deck is just dictated by how many Inspiring Overseers do I have? How many Jewel Thieves do I have? It's, it's much less about making some sort of synergies work, much more about just like picking up good generic cards because there are giant power level outliers, right? So you kind of have to group sets into is this more of a synergy set or is this more of a card quality set when you're thinking about how heavily you want to rate uh, a card synergistic value in your deck this also really matters when you're looking at uh 17 land stats right because how much synergy is in a set or how much i care about synergy in a set really has an effect on how i use 17 lands in general the less complex and the less synergistic a set is the more you can just blindly like paint by numbers, look at 17 lands for just how to draft the set. I think for uh, Streets of New Capenna, you could kind of just use uh, game and hand win rate on 17 lands, sort of just as a tier list in a way. And you'd get, you know, you'd get pretty far in just drafting a good deck just by doing that. In more complex sets, like I think uh, Strixhaven is a good example, Caldheim is a good example, where you you have a lot uh, more trouble with that. I think, uh, what's another set? There was a, uh, Kaladesh Remaster, that was another really good example where the value of a card is going to fluctuate massively based on the other cards around it. So you can't just use 17 lands blindly using that because it's going to lead you astray a lot of the time. Um, when I talk to people about sets they've done well in and sets they maybe haven't done well in, some people struggle with the more complex sets. And I think maybe that's because it's not just as easy as using a tier list or 17 lands. Um, and each pick is very much contingent on what you already have, like Strixhaven. Cube, I think, is the ultimate example of this, where, you know, you really, the, the power level in Cube, sure, there's some power level outliers, but for the most part, all the cards are very good, and you can't just take the good card, because they're all very good, and you have to know which cards play best with each other. I think the flip side of this is I've also talked to people who, they, uh, they have trouble with the more simple sets, because I think they're looking for synergy in places where they shouldn't, and that leads them astray, because you should like in SNC, just take the best card and not worry about synergy that much. So there's definitely a push and pull, and uh, it's good to identify what sets are more synergistic or which sets you care more about synergy than others. Also, um, this isn't to say that in those less synergistic sets, you can't have synergy decks. Uh, for example, in Streets of Mew Capenna, there are very synergistic decks that I've had with, let's say, Illuminator Virtuoso, which is the double striker that uh, you connives when you target it, and you know, a bunch of pump spells and protection spells. And I'm kind of like this double strike combo deck where, yeah, I very much care about synergy in, in a big way. And there's also in those very synergistic formats or cube, you can just be like, oh, cool. My deck is full of awesome, good cards, right? They're just like high power level cards that can work too. It's all on a spectrum, right? It's all on a shifting scale. I think it's just uh, important to know about that spectrum though. So those were some big picture thoughts surrounding synergy as a general concept. Um, Let's get a little bit deeper and talk about the different types of synergies you're going to encounter in draft because synergy is really just an umbrella term. When I say uh, draft synergistically, again, that doesn't really mean that much. So I, I want to try to break down the different types of synergy that you'll find in decks in different formats. So when you come across these different types of synergies, you'll know how to best approach it, how to best build and draft a deck around them. I think understanding what each different kind of synergy wants helps you more heavily or better lean into specific areas. So first and foremost, we've got strategic synergy. This is the most common type of synergy in draft that I think you'll come across. And you should be thinking about this draft in and draft out. So strategic synergy is just, do my cards on a macro level play well together? Am, am I an aggro deck? Are, are all my cards looking to attack? Am I a defensive deck? Do I want to put defenders in my deck so I can get to the late game? Maybe I'm a ramp deck and I want ramp spells, right? You wouldn't put 
Iron Apprentice, right? Thinking back to Neon Dynasty, one mana, one, one artifact that uh, comes in with a counter. And then if it dies, you can put its counters on something else. You wouldn't put that in like an enchantment based late game rampy deck, right? It just doesn't do that much. By the same merit, you wouldn't put Bamboo Grove Archer, which is the two mana, three, three defender reach in like a green beatdown modified deck. Cause that just doesn't make any sense, right? Early on in the draft, you generally want to take the best cards early, uh, just, just to have, uh, you know, access to a lot of power, right? Pick up your, lock in your power early. But I would also say pretty early on that you have a decent idea of what your deck is is going to look like and based on your you know your incentives of what you've picked up in your early picks and what kind of cards belong in your deck. There are cards that go in every type of deck, right? Aggro, control, mid-range, whatever kind of uh, strategy you're talking about. There are some cards that are just like, yeah, I, I'm going to put o Aspiring Overseer in my deck no matter what, 100%. You're also going to have decks where it's just like, yeah, or cards you're going to be like, I'm never putting... Again, a Bamboo Grove Archer in my aggressive deck. It just doesn't make sense. The main priority when drafting a deck is that all of my cards contribute to the same plan. This is what people mean by draft decks, not cards. And I, I think this one's pretty straightforward, but but I have seen people show me their deck, right? And it's like, oh, how did I go 03 with this? I, I have so many good cards. And it's like, well, okay, you've got good cards, but you've also got defenders and combat tricks in your deck. Like that just, that combination doesn't make sense. And, and sometimes it's not as blatant as defenders and combat tricks, um, but it's just like other cards that don't really make sense. And like even three to four cards that don't play well together in your deck, like if you have three or four kind of, slower cards in your aggro deck like a card draw spell or something that can really massively affect your win rate because it's almost like you're drawing a dead card sometimes right you're playing an aggro deck and you're like yeah i'm going curve out one two three and then on turn five you're like i i just need a removal spell or another creature to push over that finish line and you draw like a card draw spell and you're like yeah that's not exactly what i wanted in this exact spot right like for example in streets of new capenna I think card draw is actually a pretty good example where people are often drawn to putting card advantage slow engine cards in their somewhat aggressive decks. And uh, Cabaretti Ascendancy is actually a good example of this where I've seen a lot of people go, oh, why isn't Cabaretti Ascendancy a good card? This is the one that you look at the top card of your library and if it's a creature, you can put it in your hand. It happens on your upkeep, triggers on your upkeep. And it's like, well, I would partially argue that the rate on that card is not very good, right? You're spending three mana, not affect the board, and you get your cards back over time slowly, but, you know, it's, it's like, not that great of a card in the first place. But also, your Cabaretti decks just want to beat down, right? They don't want to be casting a slow card like that. So, the win rate of that card, one, is based on just, like, yeah, I don't think it's a great card in general. But two, the decks that the, the colors would demand it goes in, it doesn't have any synergy with the strategic synergy, right? There's no strategic synergy of that card and the other Cabaretti cards. This is the biggest thing, right? If you can just focus on strategic synergy, it's going to get you a really, really long way, I think. Next up, we've got A plus B synergy. So this is kind of like enabler versus payoff. So there's very specific examples of this. Akoria, if anybody played that or forever, uh, I'm sure somebody played that. <laughs> but whoever played that set knows that there was the cycling deck, right? Where you had cycling payoffs and cards with cycling, right? There was cards that wanted you to cast all the, or cycle all the cards of the world, like Flourishing Fox, one mana, one, one, that when you cycle a card, you put a counter on it. Uh, and then there was a bunch of one mana and two mana cycling cards. So you just had column A, you wanted in your cycling decks, you wanted all the cycling payoffs you had. And column B, you just wanted all the cycling cards. And if your deck was just filled with those cards, you'd be thrilled because your deck would just be humming, right? You just want payoffs and enablers. The same goes for the mutate deck. You just wanted cheap creatures to mutate on in column A and mutate cards in column B. That's all you really wanted. And if your deck had other cards in it that maybe didn't fit that strategy, you weren't that happy about it. Um, another example, Steel and Sack Synergies, right? If, you know, AFR, where you have Sacrifice Outlets and uh, Price of Loyalty, right? That's a pretty easy A plus B synergy. Ramp Strategies are a pretty good example of this, where you have ramp spells in column A and just big things in column B. The best type of cards for these decks is cards that are both payoffs and enablers. So I just mentioned Flourishing Fox, the one mana one one that when you cycle a card, you put a counter on it. I didn't mention that it also has cycling. So if you wanted, it's backwards compatible with other cycling payoffs, right? You draw this on turn seven when you have other cycling payoffs in play, you can just cycle it away. One of the uh, kind of dangers with A plus B synergies is you draw all of your A's or all of your B's and you don't draw a good mix of the two. And uh, if you just can have some of those backward compatible cards, that's awesome, right? You have uh, mutate is another good example where the mutators all could mutate on top of each other. So those, there was some um, kind of nice built-in protection from getting, uh, you know, drawing one half of the wrong half of your deck at the wrong time, which is a classic 
uh, pitfall or downfall of ramp strategy. Um, the balance of A plus B, like how many of the A's, how many of the B's you want, really depends on the nature of the card. With the cycling deck, you kind of just didn't really care. Just like maybe you had a, a, a you know a bottom limit of how many cycling payoffs you wanted, maybe five or six, but you were pretty happy with any number of cyclers and payoffs, honestly. Uh, the mutate deck, I would say maybe it's a 50-50 or maybe leaning a little bit towards the uh, more cheap creatures rather than uh, more expensive mutating things because if you draw all your expensive stuff, it's not going to be good. The uh, stealing sacking stuff from AFR, that's kind of interesting because there's a lot more sacrifice outlets just generally in any set with a steal and sack theme. There's a lot more sacrifice outlets than there are um, you know, cards that steal your opponent's creatures for the turn, like price of loyalty. And so when deck building, you are sorry, when you're drafting, you want to prioritize the stealing cards first, but then in actually deck building, you can't play too many price loyalties. Where you prioritize them in the draft might not be exactly reflective of how many you actually want in the in your deck build. And instead, you have to ask which is the more scarce resource, like, or which is the more scarce commodity. For cycling, there was a good mix of payoffs and cycling cards. For mutate, there's a good mix of um, cheap creatures to mutate onto and mutators. For Deadly Dispute plus press Price of Loyalty, you would generally take Price of Loyalty first, especially a few weeks in once people knew about these decks, because if you didn't get the prices, well, the Sacrifice Elves just, like, weren't anywhere near as good. So, just a few things to think about in there. Tribal Synergies are up next. So, this is often um, referring to creature types. You know, sometimes it refers to artifacts or enchantments, too. And what this is, is just cards that pay you off for having a class of card in your deck, right? So, Darling of the Masses is, is a good example, right? Four mana of two, four, all your citizens get plus one, plus zero. Oh. Um, elves in call time is another good example. Just like creature type smattering, where a lot of the times in these decks, you just have your payoffs, your few, you know, tribal things. Sometimes it's a lore that gives plus one, plus one. Sometimes it's something that gives an effect. And then you want all of the uh, elves, let's say, that you can possibly pick up, or all the citizens you can possibly pick up. Now, um, you're going to want more citizens or elves or whatever based on how many payoffs you have. And if you don't have a lot of payoffs, Maybe it's more of a pocket of synergy in your deck rather than your entire deck is doing this. But there are certainly uh, sets where you can get to the point where your entire deck is like just elves or your entire deck is just ninjas or whatever. And the more of those tribal synergies you have or the trial payoffs, the more willing you should be to just take like anything that says elf on it or anything that says ninja on it, even if that card isn't that good. Like a two minute two two that was just an elf, like didn't do anything else would be a good card if you had a few rare payoffs because it's like, hey, maybe this card doesn't do anything and it's on its own, but it's going to be very good when I draw it with my exciting uh, rare payoffs. Now, mind you, you want to uh, really temper yourself. Again, you don't want to be playing bad cards for the sake of synergy, but if those payoffs are very good payoffs, I'm thinking Elvish Warmaster from Kaldheim, which was a 2-2 uh, two, two for 2, that when an elf entered, you got a 1-1 one, one elf, and then you could pump all your elves, give them plus 2, plus 2, and death touch for 7 mana. That was a really good payoff. I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm just going to play any elf because if I draw this with that card, that's that's a really good deal. And a two-mana 2-2, two, two, the floor of that isn't really that bad, right? Um, Often when it comes to tribal synergies, cheaper cards are better, right? Because your cheaper cards come down early and then you play your lord, your, you know, whatever, your darling in the masses, and then they all get the bonus, right? It doesn't really make that much sense if you're like, okay, well, I've got darling in the masses and it's going to pump my five drop creature right like if that, that's not that good so often you want to and especially because these decks often cross over with aggro decks they are aggro decks a lot of the time cheaper citizens you know cabaret initiate might be a good example just a one mana one two double strike that would be a card that i'm happy to play in my deck if i have let's say three Dar darling of the masses if i don't get my hands on you know other better citizens right um worth noting that formats with good interaction can be hostile to these type of synergies, these tribal synergies, because one removal spell on your key creature, on your payoff, can mean your whole house of cards just comes toppling down. If you've got a, a lord that's pumping your creatures, Darling of the Masses is a good example, and your opponent's holding up an interaction spell, you can end up in a spot where it's like, okay, well, I'm hoping my combat goes a certain way because my creatures look to have plus one, plus oh, and they kill the Darling made combat, and you're like, uh-oh, uh, now they get to eat my three creatures? Like, that's just horrendous for me. So... The better cheap interaction is, or the more cheap interaction there is in a format, the worse these uh, these strategies tend to be, these tribal synergies. Um, and also, even if they are pretty good, you still have to be aware, uh, or sorry, even if they aren't that good, the interaction spells aren't that good, you still have to be aware that your opponent can dismantle your synergies one piece by one piece, and that's just in-game something you want to be uh, 
kind of worried about. All right, next up, we've got combo synergies. And the line between what is a combo and what is a synergy is a little bit blurry. But I tend to think of combo as two specific cards that I want to assemble to make something awesome, right? As opposed to like the column A, column B synergies where you're just kind of happy pairing, like mix and matching any card from column A, column B. You have two specific cards you're looking for to combo. Combo decks tend to like to see cards at an accelerated rate so that they can find their cards, you know, those combos more easily. Um, that's why in Constructed, you often find combo decks are blue because they have card draw, right? So anything that digs, like anything cantripping or anything that like, you know, a little chat would be a, a good example of like a card where if there were good combos in SNC and like, you know, there's a, there's a few I can think of, right? I was talking about the, uh, the Virtuoso combo decks where, yeah, I'm like not that sad to play a little chat in that kind of deck because I can sacrifice like a backup agent or something and find my pump spell plus protection spell on, for my Virtuoso, right? So they really like card draw and seeing all, a lot of cards so they can assemble their combos. Combos are very exciting, like game winning combos or like combos are just like, oh man, like this puts me so, so far ahead, but you have to really think about what the opportunity cost of the combo pieces is in your deck compared to how impactful the combo is when you actually assemble it. So an example of a low opportunity cost combo, I would say, is um, the, the Colossal Sky Turtle plus Season of Renewal combo from Neon Dynasty. You had your Sky Turtle and you could loop that with Season of Renewal. That was a really great combo and you wanted to play those cards in your deck anyways. You were like, huh, like, I don't mind putting Sky Turtle on my deck, I don't mind putting a Season of Renewal on my deck, and when I play both of them, it's fantastic. Another good example, this goes a few years back, um, but One with the Wind plus Jade Guardian from Ixalan, so One with the Wind is a two-mana aura that gives your creature plus two plus two in flying, Jade Guardian is a four-mana two-two hexproof creature that puts a counter on a merfolk when it enters, you slap a One with the Wind on your hexproof creature, that's just a good combo, it's gonna win the game, a lot of the time, and since Merfolk was an aggressive deck, it just wanted one with the wind, and it wanted Jade Guardian to pump your other Merfolk anyway. So, like, the best combos are cards, or the best combo pieces are cards that you're already going to want to put in your deck. These are low opportunity cost combo cards. The flip side of that is high opportunity cost combo cards. There are a lot of constructed combos. I'm thinking, like, Splinter Twin plus Pestermite. Um, for those who don't know that combo, it's just an infinite combo that when you assemble them, you just make infinite 2-1 flyers. That is a high opportunity cost combo, because the card Splinter Twin, which is a 4-mana enchantment that doesn't really do that much in Constructed mag Magic. It just taps to, uh, the enchanted creature taps to put a copy of itself on the battlefield, which is, like, not that impactful. That card is not very good on its own. There was a joke when this deck was popular in Modern that the, the Splinter Twin decks were really just, like, uh, a deck full of 56 Magic cards and 4 Pokemon cards. Because, <laughs> like, the Splinter Twins didn't do anything and you're, like, you're uh, mostly controlling deck. But it's worth it because when you assemble the combo, you just win the game on the spot. Uh, there is something like Ginny Fey, Jetmere Second in New Capenna, which is the 3-mana three 3-3 three, three that when you make tokens, it's, uh, in, in, instead of making whatever token it would make, you can make 2-2 two, two cats or 3-1 uh, dogs. And then you could combo that with something like Big Score, let's say, which is, the, you know, 4-mana, discard a card, make two treasure tokens, draw two cards. I would caution against this kind of combo because... Often in my decks that want Ginny Fey, I want to beat down. And in my beat down decks, I don't really want big score. Now, there's certainly decks I could imagine, and I have had decks where I'm more of a slower deck. I want big score anyways. I have some expensive stuff. But if you're like low to the ground, a lot of two drops, combat tricks, this isn't the worst thing in the world to put in your deck. I wouldn't be like, oh, that's terrible. Why would you do that? But I wouldn't look at this as like an actively good thing to go after because big score isn't a card you want in your beatdown deck very often, right? So this is just like, just weigh those. If it's a low opportunity cost combo, especially in limited, like be very happy about putting it in your deck because when you assemble those two things, it's awesome. High opportunity cost com uh, combo, like this kind of combo, the big score, Ginny Faith kind of thing. Really ask yourself, am I happy to draw either piece of this combo at any point in the game? Or if I draw a big score on a key turn when I'm trying to beat down, will that be a problem? And of course, if, if the payout for this combo was I win the game, yeah, sure, it's it's good to put it in your deck, just like the Splinter Twin combo. But I don't think that's the payoff. The payoff is like, okay, I get some tokens. Uh, you know, my board gets a little bit bigger a little bit sooner than I would have expected to. So just some stuff to think about. Okay, so uh, next up, we're moving into a kind of different area. Well, we're still talking about different kind of synergies, but this is a, a different subcategory of synergies. So... 
So far, I've been talking about what I would call explicit synergies. And explicit synergies are, you read the cards and you go, oh, I see how this sacrifice outlet has synergy with this price of loyalty. The words on the cards point you towards the synergies. And you're like, okay, cool. Like you, you show any player and you're like, oh, I see how those cards interact. However, there are also synergies that exist in the game that I would call implicit synergies. And these are synergies that exist not so much based on the words on the card, but exist because of how magic games and the magic game engine works and how play patterns tend to unfold in games. For example, you know, uh, instants play well with instants, combat tricks play well with creatures that your opponents are incentivized to block, that kind of stuff, right? These implicit synergies are, are things that I've picked up on through the years. And I think expanding your repertoire of recognizing, understanding these types of synergies will make you a much better draft. These can be carried through any format, and they're why good drafters can kind of pick up any new set and cobble together a functional deck no matter what. To, to use an analogy, I guess I would say it's like, if you're learning a new language, uh, explicit synergies are like the grammar, right? The spelling of the language, um, kind of like just like how the words of the language, you can teach somebody that, and it's like, okay, I understand, I can read that. Whereas the implicit synergies, they're kind of more nuanced, and they're kind of like, um, what you pick up as a, a, a native speaker, right? It's easy. It's harder to label those. It's harder to teach that, but they do exist and you can't pick them up with enough time. So I'm going to go through a bunch of explicit, uh, implicit synergies that I've kind of picked up over the years. Number one, instants play well together. This is not a, uh, a surprise or a shocker to anybody, but instants, flash creatures, counter spells, um, these cards all play well together because, for example, if you pass the turn with four mana up, you could cast your card draw spell, or you cast your counter spell, or you cast your flash creature based on what your opponent does, right? You have the uh, optionality of that. And especially when it comes to a counter spell, you really want to pair that with other instants because if you don't have other instants, then, you know, your opponent goes, okay, I attack. They maybe think they don't want to play into a counter spell and you don't get to use your mana at the end of turn if they don't play anything, right? So if I have instants on my deck, it pushes me a little bit towards having a bigger instant package. I will also say that if you only have a few instants, maybe counter spells in particular, um, they actually play worse if your cards ask you to tap out, right? You actually lose some of that instant speed flexibility because let's say you have a make disappear in your deck, right? The two mana counter spell from SNC. I mean, not to say it's a bad card and it's a card I'm going to be like, oh, I, I really want to cut this card, but maybe I don't draft it as highly if my deck is just like a, a tap out kind of maybe more of a blue white beatdown deck where I'm like, I've got a lot of creatures and a lot of tricks and that's what my deck's about i'm not going to be holding up man on my opponent's turn i more want to just cast my cards in my turn they're going to do their thing they're going to attack they're going to block that kind of stuff so um again kind of on a spectrum but in general instants flash creatures counter spells all play well together in the same vein counter spells have uh kind of a group of cards that they play well together so counter spells play well with instants like i just said but they also play well with cheap creatures and cheap spells in general. So they play well with cheap creatures because one of the um, hard things about a counter spell is if you're not ahead on board already, you kind of feel like you're you're incentivized to play something on turn three, play something on turn four, so you can stop your opponent's two drop creature. Right? They played a two drop. You can't really hold up a counter spell on turn three if you have another option because that two drop's going to start beating you down. I mean, you can, but there's a bit of tension there. If your deck is full of a bunch of cheap creatures, Lantern Bearer is a good example of this, or just the blue-white uh, Disturb deck from Crimson Vow. Single Paint and the counter spells in that format were pretty good because your deck was full of a bunch of cheap flyers that you could play on turn one, turn two, turn three, and then hold up a counter spell. That was a really good thing to do. The flip side of this is if your deck is full with like expensive cards, you don't really want counter spells because your deck's maybe a little bit clunkier and it's easy to fall behind to the point where a counter spell is not very good. I will also say that it plays well, or counter spells play well with just like cheap interaction spells, because if you do fall a little bit behind, a cheap interaction spell like a flame blast bolt, let's say, can help you catch up, but it can kill the two drop if you don't have a two drop, and then you can hold up the counter spell. Um, so just broadly, counter spells play well with cheap cards, cheap creatures especially, because it's really nice to be able to hold up that counter spell after you already dumped a, a few creatures. Mana dorks. Here's a big one. So um, when you have a mana dork in your deck, like let's say a two mana mana dork or a one mana mana dork, just something that produces mana early in the game. You can, you can focus on certain points in the curve more than others. And that depends on where your mana dorks lie. So if you have a one mana mana dork, you can play a few more threes because on turn two, 
You're going to be able to play a turn three a lot of the time, or a, a three drop spell a lot of the time. If you have a two drop mana, mana dork, you can play more fours, and you probably want to play a few fewer threes if you have enough two drop mana accelerants, right? Because often the play pattern is going to be you play the two drop mana accelerant, you play the four drop, right? You should also, and this is very obvious, but you should prioritize expensive things so that you get your money's worth out of the mana dork. Because when you play your mana dork, you don't just want to play like, all right, here's my one four drop, and now I have a bunch of cheap cards in hand, right? You do want to uh, prioritize maybe a six drop, right? Or card draw. Any way to use your mana is pretty good. Card draw plays pretty well with, with mana production as well, or mana dorks, right? Like, if my mana dork turns off by turn, I don't know, five or something, I'm not really getting a good deal. Well, I'm getting an okay deal, but I would really like my mana dork to keep producing meaningful mana throughout the course of the game, right? So, yeah, expensive things, especially if your uh, mana dork produces multiple colors. Maybe you can be like, oh, it can stretch my mana a little bit, play a few, um, you know, put, get your money's worth again for your, your, uh, your mana dork and actually make it so that that mana dork is giving something to your deck more than just a turn's worth of value. Also, you also you want ways to use your mana dorks after they're done uh, doing their job. So if you do have, let's say, not a ton of expensive things, right, and you want to be sacrificing your mana dork to something, that's kind of cool where it's like, um, you know, you have a village rights type card where after the Jaspira Sentinel, I'm using call time examples here, um, has done its work of casting your fours and fives, you can sacrifice it and it's like, okay, this mana dork isn't sitting around doing nothing anymore. It's actually giving me cards back. Or if you have equipment, that's another good reason to, uh, or another good way to use your mana dork. I've talked about this before, but I think it's a really important concept where I think people a little bit too often just shove mana dorks in their deck thinking these are like generically good cards when I think you do need a bit, you know, you need to massage your deck a little bit to have them pull their weight. Because unlike Constructed, your mana dorks, your mana accelerants, aren't playing or aren't casting like game ending seven and six drops they're casting like six mana six sixes a lot of the time and your opponent you know kills your six mana six six and the work you put in to ramp it out putting a man dork in your deck kind of gets unraveled and then you want something to you know uh play kind of backwards into being able to use your mana dork card draw okay so what pairs well with card draw so raw card draw has kind of fallen out of favor in recent years um, I've got Behold Multiverse here as, as an example that, you know, was, was a pretty good card, but I think there's not a ton of card draw that has been, you know, cards that are really desirable in the, in the past few, uh, few sets or the past year or two. And I'm talking like raw card draw, like, you know, three mana draw twos and four, and, you know, four mana scry two draw two, that kind of stuff. Not to say there are bad cards, but because so many of the cards these days just generate value on their own, these kind of cards just kind of have fallen from the way by the wayside you don't have time to cast them sets are pretty fast you don't need them necessarily because your creatures generate value um this isn't to say that they're always bad though and there are spots where i do want a few card draw uh, spells in my deck right so if you have a lot of cheap interaction and this is this is kind of the main one you want card draw in your deck because cheap interaction while it does a good thing of stopping your opponent's early creatures or killing your opponent's creatures that uh, you need to be killed, you're not getting a, uh, a a bonus, or you're not getting you're not making any uh, any headway by just kill your thing, kill your thing, kill your thing. If you have a way to refill, right, a behold the multiverse, some sort of draw three, draw two, that's nice because you can leverage that removal spell all the time you spent and cards you spent killing your opponent's creatures into pulling ahead because now you're up on cards and you have the time to cast those cards because you've killed your opponent's stuff, right? Uh, cheap interaction also plays well with card draw because let's say you don't have that cheap interaction in your open hand. Well, you cast a card draw spell. Maybe that puts you a little bit behind on board, but you draw into, you know, a shock and a deal three. And then the next turn, you can kind of catch back up on tempo. Uh, wire tapping style cards, right? Just like that. These like personal howling minds. These are another type of card that have kind of fallen out of favor a little bit in the past few years where these used to be pretty darn good and limited. You kind of just play them and the games weren't as fast and it's just like you could take over the game. And there's some games that that happens um, still, but every time we've seen this kind of effect in the last little while, it's just been too slow. I've had decks though where this kind of effect is pretty good where again, you have a lot of cheap interaction where you're like, okay, well, I'm killing your two, killing your three, killing your four. I cast wiretapping. And it will take over at this point, right? Or I just cast a big card draw spell. These are rare situations because you can't get all the cheap interaction spell in the world. Um, but just know that if you end up in a spot where you do pick up a lot of cheap interaction spells early, this is a good way to leverage it. Of course, 
another good way to leverage uh, uh, cheap interaction is just attacking your opponent. You could also do that too, but not all colors lend themselves to doing that uh, perfectly, right? If you're like a blue control deck, that's not going to be the way that you want to go. Combat tricks. Uh, so I talked about this. I had a whole episode about this last week, but just to recap, combat tricks are at their best when your opponent is going to be put in situations where you they need to block your creature. If your opponent is facing flyers, like if you have a bunch of flyers in your deck, you don't want combat tricks because your opponent's not going to have to block and your combat tricks are just going to be stuck in your hand. Yeah, they could get past, you know, the last few points of damage, but that's not that exciting. You want stuff like creatures that have a, an ability when they hit, they do something. Or, you know, in Kaldheim, we had the boast ability, which means that, like, if your opponent didn't block your boast creature, you'd activate your boast ability, you get some value, and your opponent didn't want to keep you doing that each turn, so they want to block, and you could use your tricks to get them. Cards with abilities like Lifelink, that also incentivizes your opponent to block. So, if I have a bunch of creatures in my deck that maybe attack, and when they deal damage, they draw a card, I'll be more interested in putting a combat trick in my deck. Again, if you want to see the big story on this, I did a whole episode on this last week. You can go check that out on the podcast feed or on the Limited Level Ups YouTube uh, channel. Flyers. Here's another one. What pairs well with flyers? Well, ground creatures that block. If I have a bunch of cheap flyers like Fairy Vandals and Celestial Regulators in my deck, I'm more happy to put something like Broker's Initiate in my deck, just like a one-man 4 because my flyers are pecking in. The Broker's Initiate holds the ground, blocks the 2s and the 3s, and a lot of the 4s too. They also want, flyer decks also want uh, bounce spells more than any deck because unlike, you know, a deck that might be playing a little bit of a longer game where they need to actually, you know, your opponent plays a bomb on turn four, turn five, you can't just bounce that thing and hope that it, it's going to be gone for the rest of the game. If you have a bunch of flyers, you can more reliably go, okay, I bounce your bomb, it buys me a turn and because I have a, uh, a really good reliable clock with my cheap flyers. I'm going to be able to, you know, take advantage of that, and that bomb's not going to matter that much. Cards that, like, out of the way, that draw you a card on your bounce spell are fantastic, but if Unsummoned was in Streets of New Capenna, I might just play, you know, one mana bounce a creature. That wouldn't be that bad in a lot of my decks with a lot of flyers. Last thing here, uh, mana base and curve synergies. So, um, this is maybe not quite in the same realm, but I, it's just something I was thinking about when I was making the show notes for this, where... Often, I will make draft picks based on curve or mana base concession, uh, considerations. The the place I think this most comes up is when you're drafting an aggressive deck that you really want to focus on one color of mana for. Aggressive decks are best when you are close to a monocolor deck, so you don't have to worry about you know mana putzing around with your mana and drawing the wrong colors at the wrong time. If you have almost a completely mono red deck, that's a really good thing to do. I'm thinking back to uh, Neon Dynasty, where it's like, okay, well... If I had a few black cards in my red-black deck, that was okay, but I maybe didn't want to have like 7 or 8, 9, 10 black cards. And I would especially not want a double-pipped black card in my deck. Something like Twisted Embrace, which is a very good card, good removal spell, but it, it was kind of like anti-synergistic with the rest of my deck because so many of my cards were red and I wanted so many mountains in my deck. So that's a big thing uh, to consider. Curve considerations is another thing too, where it's just like, you know, you could almost view this as a type of synergy where... If you just have a lot of one drops in your deck, that's kind of a synergy because a bunch of one drops play well together because you're, you'll more often have that one drop on turn one and on turn two be able to go one drop, one drop on turn two, and then maybe on turn three you go one drop, three drop. Um, that was a big uh, feature of the red mono red decks in Neon Dynasty. Also, like you would just think of aggressive decks as a type of synergy deck too, right? Where you're not playing the best cards in a vacuum, but you're hoping to leverage a cheap curve and play combat tricks and, you know, maybe some kind of like scrappier cards and the synergy of those cards kill your opponents faster than the generically good cards is something that you can kind of lean towards. So a lot of the time um, when I'm drafting, one of the one of the most common questions is, you know, when I'm drafting these aggro decks, it's like, well, don't you want that more powerful card? And it's like, no, because the impact it'll have to my mana base is so bad, I think, that I just want to take the slightly worse card. I'm not going to make giant power level concessions, but... I'll happily take, you know, going back to Neon Dynasty, Clawing Torment, which is the one mana black enchantment that makes something not block and drains them um, or pings them on their upkeep over Twisted Embrace. Arguably, Clawing Torment was just a better deck and aggressive deck or better card and aggressive decks anyways, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. All right, last part, I'm just going to talk about some application. So we talked a lot of theory with some examples. Hopefully it wasn't too abstract, but when you actually sit down at the draft table or when you're perform uh, preparing for a format, I think uh, here are a few things you can think about. So, one, know which synergies are worth going after. This is a very simple one, but you could show me a Neon Dynasty draft where you had all of the samurai in the world 
wouldn't care, <laughs> right? You would be like, look how synergistic my deck is. Doesn't matter, right? Because those synergies suck and they're not worth going after. On the flip side, you could have a, a uh, draft where you're like, oh, cool. I have all the enchantment synergies in the world. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Like you've got three generous visitors. That's a really good, uh, that's a really good synergy to go after in this set. Like your deck must be pretty good. This is something you have to have a bit of foresight uh, on going into the set, of course. But it's worth noting that some some dreams, like, just let them die, <laughs> right? Like, you're never going to get the awesome Samurai deck because the cards just don't exist. They, they don't line up well with the format. Maybe they're just not good um, in a vacuum, right? They just, they just don't make sense together. So it's like, yes, as much as you can have that dream, again, I'm going back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the, of the uh, podcast here, you can have this dream of, oh, my cards that aren't so good work well together when they are pairing them together and I have the perfect combination. Sometimes even when you have that supposed perfect combination, it just doesn't work out and you, you just kind of have to let that go. Just draft the good card. When do you play bad cards? Here's something that uh, you know is a pretty common question. So when do you play cards like Goldhound or Otherworldly Gaze from Midnight Hunt, which is a single blue mana instant, look at the top three cards of your library, you can put them back in any order or put any number of them in your grave. You flash back for one and a blue. Or Gold Hound, which is, of course, the one mana, one, one. First strike mana's creature. Sack it. You add a mana to your mana pool. These cards are not good cards. They are, I think, for all intents and purposes, bad cards. They do have homes in their respective formats where I would be happy to play them. And in fact, if you go to uh, Two Duck Cube's Twitter, or if you go to just the 17 lands um, where they post articles there, Two Duck Cube, Carl posted this uh, really cool article where he looked at uh, win rates of the top, mid, and low players, right? This is the, the new feature on 17 lands. And he looked at specific cards that were better in the hands of good players. Good players knew when to play these bad cards. Goldhound had the, I think it was the most improved out of all the commons in the set, in the hands of good players. Potentially even, uh, might even be the best card overall, actually. Not, not even commons, but just like rares and uncommons too. Because... When you have a deck that's good for Goldhound, a bunch of body droppers, maybe you've got some good fours, it actually makes sense to put the card in your deck even though it's not generically a good card. Same with Otherworldly Gaze. If you had a lot of graveyard synergies, a lot of disturbed cards, this card really said, you know, one blue mana, draw some number of cards all of the time and set up the top card of your deck and then you could flash it back. The rule of thumb, I think, when you're trying to say, well, I mean, like, you know, the, the entire podcast, I'm saying, don't play these bad cards, because, like, like, just for synergy purposes, but now I'm saying, well, there are some times you should play them. The rule of thumb is the worse the card is in a vacuum, the more weight it has to pull. Goldhound, if I just have, like, two body droppers, I'm probably still not going to play it. But if I have two body droppers, maybe three body droppers and a few other things that care about sacrifice and maybe I'm splashing and I also have like a few good forests to ramp out to. If all these things add up, then I can maybe consider playing that kind of card. And the same thing with otherworldly gaze, right? If I have a density of stuff in the graveyard, I have like, you no know, 10 things I can cast from the graveyard. Yeah, then the card's pretty good because it does synergize with a lot of the cards in my deck. I think that Mystical Dispute, uh, Carl's podcast, Carl's podcast with G-Guards is great for illuminating these types of cards because they go deep on these types of cards where yeah not a great card in a vacuum but you are the situation so if you want more of that content i would i would highly recommend looking at uh mystical dispute that podcast is really good for talking about this kind of stuff and that is it chat thank you so much for hanging out we're gonna send a chat for a q a if anybody has any questions on this topic um yeah send them to me and yeah we'll, we'll uh see what the floor has to say all right, first question. Can you talk a little bit about, about committing to one way to win, like an aggro deck? Sometimes I'll take a good card, quote-unquote, that doesn't quite fit into the current game plan in case I can't quite get there or I might have to pivot. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the things I talked about today weren't quite in relation to what you should do in the draft in relation to synergy, right? A lot of them, a lot of things I talked about were kind of like giving you the tools and then, um, you know, I, I maybe skimped on the application a little bit here. So what I would say when that, like, say you're drafting a good aggro deck, um, like, let's say you're drafting, I'm going to go back to the mono red deck in Neon Dynasty, right? You're drafting a really good mono red deck, and uh, you, you come across, like, let's say a soul transfer. That's probably a good example of a card. Soul transfer, for those who don't know or don't remember, is one black black for a removal spell that uh, buys back a creature from the grave and exiles a creature, if you have both an enchantment or an artifact, or it only does one if you um, 
only, it only does one if you only if you don't uh, meet the enchantment and artifact uh threshold that's the kind of card that not so much because the kind of that card is bad right it's not it's, it's a very good card and not so much that it doesn't fit into an aggressive deck if it just cost red red or sorry red red colorless i would be more into it but because it's like black black it's like well should i take this here uh, for maybe the times I don't get that straight mono red deck, and I, I'm just more of a split on black and red. That decision is very much going to be... I'm going to make that decision very much based on, one, how good is that card? Like, if it's a game-winning card that maybe it costs five mana, and maybe it is double black, but it's just one of the best cards in the set, yeah, sure, you take it. You know, if it's not that good, it's like a 58 game hand win percent card, I'm less likely to take it and just take like a like whatever kind of decent two drop the other thing that matters of course is what's the opportunity cost what are you passing on right if you're passing on a card that would be good in your aggressive deck let's take an iron apprentice for this mono red deck and neon dynasty i'll probably just take the iron apprentice there because I, I i actively want the card in your, your my in that deck and i think that's what it really comes down to do i actively want that other card in the deck right and how good is that card in the deck you and also make your decision if it's a little bit later in the draft based on what you've seen in the draft and how open you think your lane is. Like, if you think your mono-red lane is not that open, totally hedge because there's a good probability you might have to move off of that mono-red lane, play more black cards. But if you think your mono-red lane is just open, no, just take that Iron Apprentice, right? Is it possible to learn what the best synergies are going to be in spoiler season? No. I think this is the number one thing that's very difficult to predict in spoiler season because it's without getting your hands on the cards... And actually playing with them and getting that just intuitive gut feeling of, oh, this was really good or this wasn't so good. I, I don't think even the absolute best people at looking at a set and figuring out what's going on in the set beforehand, before playing, can really suss that out. I think that that's the thing that you should be looking for, actually, when you start playing a set. Like, before you play the set, look at the cards, look how what the themes are telling you to do, try them out, and then confirm or... Uh, disprove some theories you might have about which synergies are good or not, right? I, I think that's actually the number one thing you can get out of week one play. I would just say no. It's it's very, very difficult to do so because there's, number one, there's so much just context of how what cards you want in your deck versus what cards you're often going to see in your opponent's deck. Um, but also just like, again, that gut feeling of like, oh, how, how does it feel when I steal their creature and sack it to deadly dispute well obviously we know that and there are some synergies that's actually maybe not the best example because there are some synergies that are um you know repeatable or, or that have been in previous sets that we can go oh we know how good stealing uh and stealing and sacking is when the stealing card is three mana and the sacrifice element is two mana like that's pretty good right we, we there's newer synergies that come forth that we might not be as accustomed to and those are harder to predict but yeah sometimes you can go in and be mostly right about your predictions on synergy if you have seen the type of synergy before then again you might not it might be the case that that particular synergy doesn't actually line up very well with the format so then again you don't know so um my my answer is no mostly to that yeah a really good example actually we have in chat so there are star people from strixhaven right which is the one mana 1-1 one, one for white that you put a counter on it, uh, or it comes in with a counter, and then when it dies, you move the counters to some other creature, right? That card was really bad in Strixhaven. Even in decks that look like you wanted to play that card, it just wasn't one you wanted to do because the Silver Cool cards didn't care enough about counters, and like the Star People like didn't have enough synergies. You weren't really sacrificing that card. And then we saw a very similar card, Iron Apprentice, in Neon Dynasty. And that card was very good in the aggressive decks because... There was the artifact, uh, you know, synergies on top of that. And you did sack your Iron Apprentice once in a while, right? So, like, your Oni Kelty Anvil or whatever card it was. So, yeah, even synergies that look similar to ones we've seen in the past, just, like, one or two different tweaks to the format, a card being there that wasn't in the previous format, uh, you know, a toughness or a power added somewhere, that's going to have ripple effects on the format. Theros Beyond Death is coming to Arena this week. Uh, can you speak to how important Synergy is in that set? Yeah, for sure. So, Theros is largely defined by the rares, I would say. Now, not all the games will be, but a large portion of the games come down to how powerful the rares are because there's a lot of very good rares that are hard to deal with, invalidate the game actions that have taken place before in the game, uh, are 
sometimes just like you can't interact with them because they have hexproof or they're sagas so they're difficult to interact with uh so <laughs> like in the grand scheme of things the the most important thing about theros i think is trying to draft bombs leave yourself open in the draft to be able to p uh, pick up bombs that people are passing you and draft cards that help you find your bombs like you know cantrips and card draw spells stuff like that um, also prioritizing good interactions so you can deal with, you know, some of your opponent's bombs. So that's my main thing, which doesn't really answer the question, I suppose. But there are definitely synergy uh, considerations in Theros. The main one being Escape, which is a mechanic that lets you cast cards or from your graveyard creatures generally by exiling some number of cards from your grave. So, like, for example, there's a card. Uh, it's a, it's a three-mana 4-1 that... You can cast from your grave by paying five mana and exiling three cards from your grave. That card is one of the better cards, one of the better commons in the format. Um, I really like that card. Maybe not one of the better ones, but a, a pretty good one. Um, I, the name is escaping me. It's some sort of Chimera, the green card. All the cards with escape, one of the synergy things you have to think about, not just in you know putting cards in your graveyard helps fuel those, but every card that goes to your grave whether that be a removal spell or a you know uh, a, a traveler's amulet those all count for a portion of a card or a percentage of a card right because if your chimera comes back for three cards going to your grave casting a removal spell means that's a third of a card right so that's like one of the biggest things i, I would say as far as thinking about synergy goes um getting cards into your grave and con card economy kind of you know is 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 presented in a way that we're not usually used to trading is bad if your opponent has escape cards in your grave in their grave trading is good if you have escape cards in your grave um so yeah it's it's, it's this this weird thing that you, maybe you're uh if you haven't played the set before it, it takes a little bit of getting used to all right so we're gonna pack it up from there uh next episode will be at our normal scheduled time either thursday or friday coming out um this episode's on a bit of an odd day We'll have Sam Black on the podcast. I teased this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago, but we finally scheduled a time. If all things go well, I sh Sam should be joining me on the stream. And yeah, we'll have a good episode. All right. See you around, everybody. Oh, I should also say, I think it's going to be a Q&A episode. So if you want to get a question into Sam, you can post that in the Limited Level Ups Discord in the future episode suggestion part of that Discord. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. See you, everybody. And yeah, we'll see you next time.